Well, what a wonderful version of uh, number four by Eddie Puche. And now we will be talking about the digital era with Concepcion Monge and Guillem Martinez. So Concepcion Monge is one of the top 100 living women in Spain, an international researcher. She's working on control architecture for humanoid robots. She's part of Robotics Lab and the director of the CATS UC3M, CEO of RoboCats, the creator of Robotia, a RoboCat, a humanoid existential robot designed to improve the quality of life of the elderly. disabled people and people with special needs. And we have and then Guillem Martinez Roda. And the and she will be interviewed by a very special person who has published many books and is an advocate for oceans. So this is the video, an introduction video. Concepción Monge es una científica líder en robótica y control de sistemas. Es un referente por su investigación en el avance de la robótica centrada en las personas. Concepción es la creadora del robot Teo, un robot humanoide asistencial para mejorar la calidad de vida de las personas mayores con discapacidad o necesidades especiales. Su trabajo en este campo ha sido ampliamente premiado y reconocido, llegando a colaborar con diversas instituciones a nivel mundial. Concepción ha sido premiada como Mejor Científica Contemporánea y es miembro del Top 100 Mujeres Líderes de España desde 2021. Guillem Roura es el coordinador de robótica e inteligencia artificial de la Unión Internacional de Telecomunicaciones, la agencia especializada de las Naciones Unidas para las TIC. Es uno de los fundadores y director de Robocat, un campeonato de robótica inclusivo en el que han participado más de 4.000 jóvenes y que fomenta el aprendizaje y la colaboración, independientemente de la condición socioeconómica o capacidad académica, para diseñar y construir robots que ayuden a conseguir los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Cada año, los participantes de la RoboCat diseñan, construyen y programan un robot que complete una misión para resolver retos globales. Wow. Bueno, ¿qué tal? ¿Se me oye? ¿Sí? Good. Can you hear me? So this is wonderful. This is awesome. This is the second part of Empower Life 2023. Live music, two very interesting speakers. So let's talk about robotics breakthrough and robotics revolution in the digital era. This is a very passionate and amazing topic. Concepción is an expert on this topic, but let's use some images to illustrate this topic, this concept. Let's play a new video. Estamos en el laboratorio Please. de robótica humanoide y robótica blanda del Robotics Lab aquí en la Universidad Carlos III de Madrid y aquí desarrollamos um, articulaciones blandas para robots. La idea es reemplazar miembros rígidos de estos robots que los hacen pues, más peligrosos y más inestables por otros miembros so mucho más versátiles, deformables, que absorben el golpe cuando so se produce dicho golpe y que permiten que la estabilidad del robot sea mucho más eh, robusta. Imaginad que queremos acceder a una tubería. ¿no? Pues hacerlo con un robot rígido es muy difícil porque se quedaría eh, finalmente atascado, mientras que si lo que tenemos es un gusano elástico, pues podríamos abordar ese, esa inspección eh, y de una forma mucho más segura y más, eh, digamos, flexible y versátil. Estos robots, al estar hechos de materiales blandos, permiten la absorción de, de golpes y, por tanto, una robustez en la interacción humano-robot mucho mayor que con un robot rígido. A mí me gusta eh, pensar que a nivel asistencial eh, podemos hacer una aportación, porque es muy importante que los robots que asisten a personas sean cada vez más seguros 
y que sean mucho más versátiles en sus movimientos. Hay una línea innovadora eh, que versa sobre origamis, que son pues, eh, volúmenes deformables que se comprimen eh, eh, y que permiten una movilidad ¿no? de, la, de la articulación. Somos capaces de, midiendo sobre el propio material, estimar la deformación que están sufriendo. De manera que eh, en el mismo cuerpo tenemos no solamente la actuación de deformación, sino también la sensorización de la deformación que se está provocando, sin necesidad de poner sensores adicionales que generalmente son rígidos y que bueno, pues en, esta, en este acoplamiento del sensor al propio material pues hay pérdida de información y hay desajustes. Esta medida de la deformación es necesaria para saber en qué posición se encuentra dicho eslabón, qué tensiones está sufriendo y poder actuar y controlar la articulación de manera que se consiga lo que queremos hacer con ella, que es posicionarla como queremos, pero a la vez preservarla de pues, eh, pues una rotura del material eh, que pudiera hacerla inservible. ¿no? Por lo tanto, es una necesidad obligada eh, dar este salto y que los robots del presente ya y del futuro pues, sean cada vez más bioinspirados y tengan este cuerpo blando que facilite eh, una interacción mucho más versátil y segura. Me ha encantado este... So this is a new notion, bioinspiration, digital sovereignty. New terms that we are now learning today. I was really struck to see that something so distant from nature, I'm talking about robotics, is in reality inspired by nature. It's because much of your work finds inspiration in very subtle things, for example, the stem of a plant, for example. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me here today. I am very happy. And yes, of course, nature is very wise, and more than 90% of all products in nature are flexible and soft. That's why they're so adaptable, precisely because they're soft and flexible and we want to find inspiration in them for robots because we want them to survive in a human environment and softness and flexibility has enabled plants and we hope robots to survive in uh, specific climate conditions by stretching out or by uh, folding and folding like a wire like a stem you, you can make them shrink and then stretch out again with foam memory or shape memory. And that is what we want to emulate in our robots. They look like tendons, artificial tendons, right? But they can, for example, fold and unfold an arm when there is an exoskeleton through wires. Uh, from a uh, wrist to a shoulder and when you apply heat you can fold your arm or you can unfold it when heat is no longer applied so we call them smart materials per se they are intrinsically smart and by managing the climate conditions or the environmental conditions we can control that type of robots it's like they, they are like a specific intelligence because they can react to heat, cold, certain external stimuli. So they are like kind of smart. And yes, even we have some self-healing materials. I don't know if you've heard about them. They are self-healing <laughs> because when they crack, they can heal themselves, they can self-heal uh, if uh, they are under a specific process, heat or hydrogels with water, and they seal, they heal. And there are some edible robots, like something that you can swallow and they will heal you from inside. Yes, these are materials that have certain drugs inside or even sensors that by by uh, swallowing them, by eating them, they can act on certain specific parts of your body. They can release the drag or they can um, act within your body. For example, with um, they're very useful for children. If they have trouble eating, uh, you can put them into a gummy bear 
and they are swallowing a drug instead of disguising them in a, in a spoonful of soup you can hide them in a gummy bear so they can they can eat them easily so this is a revolution in terms of robotics in the digital era the component the first component of this uh, robotic revolution is for you flexible robotics or soft robotics but Guillem you're talking or you're working on Robocat we're talking about robotics sustainable robotics yes Robocat well, first of all, thank you for having me here today, of course. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to represent the International Communication Union and president of Robocat, which is a championship and educational robotics. The championship, championship sorry, was born uh, seven years ago, and the purpose was to bring technology and educational robotics to teenagers, boys and girls, in school years. It was born in Girona, but now we're working for across Europe and Spain and the rest of the world too. This is very, very difficult, of course, but the idea behind it was to create a robotic breakthrough based on three pillars. It has to be inclusive so that there are no barriers or obstacles for anyone interested in robotics or encoding. It's now available for all teenagers and kids across the world. The second pillar is that it has to be free or creativity has no boundaries. So it is not linked to a specific provider or, um, or brand. It has to be completely free. And it's also focused on the sustainable development goals. So the 24 edition of Robocat will be focused on natural disasters. Robots that will be competing on, it's like a game board. And they will have to solve a specific problem. For example, there is an earthquake, a building will collapse randomly, is in real life. So they have to solve it. They have to solve that challenge, that problem. The, the enrolled teenagers, the enrolled kids will be participating in teams and they will have to find the drags, the victims, um, the casualties and they will have to help solve the problem they have to evacuate them to a hospital etc so yet this is a competition and there's something very interesting there we're talking about transfer transfer a kind of project these kinds of projects into real life you're a researcher and you're the promoter of this competition so this kind of initiatives can help solve these real-life problems with just a very modest financial investment. And they help solve financial um, or very difficult problems. Yes, transfers. Technology transfers are challenging. Some transfers are very difficult. So some initiatives are very hard to transpose or to transfer to uh, the reality, but Guillem has devised a um, means to an end. Robotics is not the end, it's just a means. So when you talk about a catastrophe or a natural disaster and how you document that, helping these kids understand that perception with a social involvement, with a social impact is awesome because new generations will learn about how to care about natural disasters and how to transfer technologies from the theory to a real life situation, from a theoretical scenario to a real life situation, because researchers have always been subject to the published or Paris problem. We have, um, we have had to work on our papers and our theoretical research, and now, 
we are encouraged to start doing something about that, to start transferring what we are researching into uh, the real life. For example, creating a spin-off or, or a specific handsome project. So you decided you decided to start a, a research career, a career in research. You used to play piano. Yes, I'm very envious of the piano that is now on stage. Well, anyway, mathematics is also very related to music. So in some in some sense you are in some aspects you are pursuing an artistic career. But from your academic perspective, you can see that people are now, there are more women, more young women are starting to enroll in this type of career, research career. This is very, well, this is quite obvious. So I'm, I'm. Sometimes I feel ridiculous talking about it, but we have to remind ourselves of the fact that women have to get involved in all areas of society, especially when we talk about science, technology, or especially technology or robotics. If we want to have more granularity, diversity is a must because we are creating machines that will be making decisions on our behalf that will be interacting with us. So. We have to invite and we have to make sure that we are representing all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of personalities. Yeah, even the narcissists that we were talking about in the previous interview. All sensitivities and all personalities have to be there, have to be invited, have to play in this equation. That's why it has to be inclusive. Yes, of course, Rebecca's. And the initiative that we will be talking about later are really all about inclusion, robotics and artificial, artificial intelligence that has to be inclusive for men and women and also for all the countries in the world to be fully represented. So in the new Robocat edition, you, you said that you will be working on natural disasters and I want to, I would like to to give us some examples and some wonderful ideas on how robotics and um, artificial intelligence in being applied on natural disasters. For example, two weeks ago, there was um, an earthquake in Morocco. As you know, in, there is a growing community of people who specialize in robotics for natural disasters. And um, I received a text from one of them. They wanted to get in touch with the United Nations agency who that works on natural disaster relief and humanitarian aid. This technology is at the our fingertips. For example, there will be drones identifying casualties and victims of the earthquake. Uh, or the areas where the earthquake has been specifically or especially intense, that is already available. But some of the people uh, do not have what technology is available for them, and there is no international coordination. So we are working on that and coordinating all the available agencies and all the available means so that we can act on it immediately because every minute counts. So. Robots have been sent from the ITU. There's a focus group on with a composed of experts of um, artificial intelligence who work on developing apps for um, identification of areas and casualties. And in Robocats, we will be working in abstractions of these kind of realities or catastrophes, and it will be low cost. It's free hardware and free software robotics, and they will be building a prototype, but they can extrapolate that learning to a real life experience, to a real 
company, a real enterprise. So they will become aware that technology needs to be applicable on the society. But for example, you can work on climate applications, for example, for improving the yield of crops. It can save many lives in places that are suffering, that are subject to extreme drought. There is an initiative, a startup platform created by United Nations for them to get funding and support. And for example, they give current projects that are now working on the field. For example, there is one initiative that is giving visibility to a specific app that is uh, offering insurances for small growers in Africa so that they can use artificial intelligence in their, in their, in their mobile devices and they can they can they can buy an insurance for their crops it looks very obvious and evident to us but not for them so this is very interesting because um, for example we have uh, any we have we also have challenges for machine learning and other kind of challenges for which we don't have a, a, a specific solution as of now and by launching these challenges we identify solutions for example we discovered that there were many uh, time um, weather weather registration or weather recording stations in Africa the same number in Africa than in Germany. So we decided to give more of these um, weather stations to specific areas in Africa so that they can detect some, some, some threats and some challenges that will, be, um, that will become a problem for them well in advance as we are used to doing in Europe. We are now using only 10% into achieving the sustainable development goals. Last week there was uh, the assembly in New York to talk about the SDGs and they've decided to use robotics and artificial intelligence to solve some of the pending challenges of the outstanding challenges to make the most of it. So we can use a yet for good platforms this kind of platforms that were really created to serve this purpose we'll be talking about artificial intelligence and many more of the ideas that you've been mentioning but i would like to know how this artificial intelligence is being used in the design in designing the humanoid robots we were seeing teal I'm especially fan of it because my son's name is Teo. Teo. How are you using artificial intelligence in motion, in the designing of the, and how this this robot moves, how it motions? Rigidity is so so useless we want everything to be flexible and soft so please talk about how you've been working to how you're making to act more um, gracefully or flexibly or softly how to make it motion like a human we are trying to give these um, specific skills skills to, to our robots in my lab Artificial intelligence is being applied to a specific purpose. It's it's not we're not working on chatbots or things like that or, or or robots used for trading. No, everything relates to emulating the human body and how the human body works. For example, if we are creating a humanoid robot, we want it not to trip something when it walks around. 
or um, if uh, we're talking about a robot that is inspecting or um, or perusing or um, stretching its arm in order to find something under a pile of rocks, for example, in a catastrophe. This is a, 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 an intelligence that is closely linked to the hardware component. So that is a specific type of artificial intelligence that is closely related to the bodily part, to the, to the body motion. It is closely linked to the decisions made by the body and the, the artificial behind it, the intelligence behind it. But you're talking about caring robotics. Care robotics or support robotics. So yes, the information comes through a set of sensors that are embedded on the robot so that they can make the most appropriate decision. They can have to measure the environment and the what is going on in the user so that the decision will be made based on the current scenario. If we're talking about caring or um, support, the robot will be interacting with a person probably with disabilities. So there are risks in the interaction and robots have to make sure that safety and security are always warranted. Because when we test them in hospitals, people are reluctant. I wouldn't say reluctant to interact with a robot if they can see that it's useful, but they kind of, um, they don't trust it. They don't trust it uh, from day one because sometimes the robot maybe approaches the patient too fast and you, they cannot use their hands to protect themselves from the robot. So that's something that we have to always refine and improve. Um, it's not like a human being who will hopefully um, adapt its behavior, their behavior to the patient's reactions. So we want the robots to to be humanoid. And for example, if there is a collision, we want the material of the robot to be flexible or um, resistant to to random impacts or hits. We were what we were seeing in the video, robotics being applied to something so delicate, nature, plants, etc. This is fascinating. We work in this lab and, and it is surprising for us because sometimes we start working on something, a specific trait of nature or a specific trait of a plant and sometimes we don't know where it will take us. We don't know where we will be, where we can, we are, when we can apply it, but we know that something good will come, will come out of it. For example, for a, um, for a catheter or um, <laughs> for, for special um, surgical procedures or interventions. This is so interesting, so fascinating. Artificial intelligence also raises a social concern. We're all very, or somehow concerned about this. Is is it something positive, something negative? Will it be a friend or a foe, or? You were talking about regulations. We need it. We need for it to be regulated. We need a legal framework to put some boundaries or limits on it. Yes, this is something that is high on the agenda since Chat GPT was officially launched in November last year, when the public opinion started to to use it. But I figured. Is an initiative that was launched launched several five years ago. It's like a networking platform that links uh, people working on these technologies with people with 
best special problems or needs, for example, patients in a hospital or people with special needs or disabilities. And next month, there will be a high-level advisory board on AI. It's been created because the Secretary General for the United Nations uh, requested so. And we have identified a group of a panel, a group of experts that will be working on um, a report on the uses of artificial intelligence. That will be published the report soon, in a few months' time. And we've been talking about the possibility of having leaders of the high techs to create an agency similar to the International Organization for Atomic Energy, but for artificial intelligence, because artificial intelligence affects all the verticals, all the industry verticals. But we think that it is, if it is a global concern, it has to be under the scope of the United Nations Agency because it really occurs for the whole population, the whole world, and it will include academia, the industry, all aspects and all sectors. So it have to be attractive both for from the global south and the global north with many different sensitivities. This is really interesting. Regulation is a hot topic. And this section, this section called digital sovereignty under construction, this under construction is so important because we are really under construction. The new world order is under construction. We're talking about digital right protection and many other things but we can also we should also protect access to artificial intelligence so that people can really get access to artificial <coughs> intelligence for their own personal projects to be achieved you think that is that is a fundamental right for them for the whole population yes everybody should be really well aware in adequately informed that should be well informed because artificial intelligence is based on data. Those who have the power are those who own the data. So we need to find the initiatives for the data to really serve a public purpose, a public interest purpose. So it is not an end but a means for social advancement. And that's precisely what we need to work on, and that's what we do from the UN. I think that it's also very interesting to see how AI is impacting education. We all know how harmful ChatGPT is to um, assignments in schools. So what do you do in the classroom? Since the AI arrived, what are you doing? You cannot forbid it. No, we need to integrate it. We need to take it in. Uh, I think I'm quite lucky because the subjects I teach are very hands-on. So you have to uh, do things with cables and programming, and it's very practical. So students are face-to-face -face with the robots directly so they cannot be shielded behind uh, artificial intelligence so what we do is uh, to integrate those tools and uh, run simulations so they can test the theory they've learned in class and learn more and reinforce what they've learned and uh, underpin their knowledge so in the end Part of the student's training needs to be directly in touch with technology. And it should go both ways. 
It is not only about uh, getting information from a computer. It has to go both ways. And I'm, I know I'm lucky because in other subjects you cannot do that. And with oral exams, yes, and in many places they do oral exams. And that would be a possibility to test your um, students' skills directly. But it takes more time, more resources, and a more focused exam model. But it's also a good idea. We were discussing the special needs of students yesterday, last night. And that's also a possibility to uh, adapt the exams to the special needs of those people. And it needs to go both ways, like you said. If you have uh, AI tools for programming or whatever, it can't be just something that you use the standard way. You have to ask yourself things and sometimes you go to a scratch workshop with video games or things like that and many of the students only consume the video games put forward by the platform instead of creating new platforms or new games so the important thing here is to mix technology and uh, the human aspects. Jorge is here with the microphone and I know what it means, but I want to ask a last question. A la uh, you, can, you can ask too. Just one more thing, because um, I don't want to run out of time. Uh, we were speaking about your work, but Stephen at the very beginning of his presentation, spoke about linking projects and ideas with those having the ability to fund those ideas. I would like to know more about the project you're working on, uh, on exis existential robotics and the exoskeleton. Yeah, the one that's applied to the neck. Yes, it's... Uh, um, a very, uh, it's an idea that it's uh, uh, a very early, at a very early stage. It's like a collar. It's a collar that works like an exoskeleton that monitors the moves of a person's head to either prevent certain moves and prevent uh, injuries or to make your head move if you're not uh, able to do it yourself. And it could be something, it could be a major breakthrough for uh, patients of um, ELA or other conditions. ALS um, patients uh, would benefit from it much. And you do it from the neck and not from the head. That's quite interesting. Yes, because the way to articulate or to move your head is to do it from your neck. There are other some uh, some other mechanisms that do it with uh, a band around the uh, the head, but uh, um, we think it's much more interesting to do it from the neck. And it's also um, uh, very important when it comes to studying wheelchairs and other things. That's amazing, wonderful. We have wonderful researchers, and that's uh, brilliant. And I'm sure you have uh, 1,000 questions, especially those at the top, so Jorge has to go all the way up. Good morning, or well, well, good afternoon. I'm very interested, well, my name is Genoveva Garcia, and I am promoting a women association in Malaga. Regarding what Concepcion and Guille said about making that technology more inclusive, um, at a congress in Andalusia with uh, women, we were wondering what we could do against uh, sex violence online. And AI came up, and we saw the piece of news of uh, girls who've had 
uh, had uh, AI created naked bodies and those pictures had been uh, shared. Well, we would like to know what's being done with those cases because women feel very unprotected and not very related to technology or they don't feel that technology can help them or support them or help them prevent those um, uh, uh, that violence. When those fake pictures came up, there were some recommendations for platforms to uh, have some kind of sign. You need to find balance. This is yet another type of um, misinformation and it need to be um, identified and signaled and it should be clearly signaled that uh, that's a deep fake and that's not actual or real uh, information or data that uh, and then there is the discussion do we need to remove that content or we just need to uh, signal it as uh, wrong. There are different uh, regulation directives in the EU. As a pioneer um, body that's negotiating the AI Act, and um, that's uh, they're going to come up with a protocol for those actions. And yes, that's uh, a problem indeed. And uh, like pieces of news that you might get and they seem to be uh, truthful. And now you can take a, a, someone's voice and replicate it and make them say things that they never said. And that, that's uh, a gateway gateway to lots of misinformation. If you have never heard anything about this technology, you of course you're going to believe it and you're going to think it's real. What do you think about your perspective as a, uh, from your point of view as a woman? We are seeing this from the point of view of regulation now. Now it's uh, completely on us. But the, I think education is key. Same, just as you teach children that you're not, they're not supposed to litter, you have to teach them simple things like that. Because everything is based on education, on being taught that you're not, uh, that you can't do that. You can't share videos like that, right? Yes, and probably you can stop it from uh, with education. I don't know how you can do this. This is a matter of values, and it's probably more convenient letting other people do this. But that's not something you can really control. So all you can do is to educate your children and let them know that this is not something you can share. It would be a problem if women consider technology uh, something that is not an ally, an ally. It's important that they perceive technology, that we perceive technology as an, ally, as an ally as well. Good afternoon. I think this was a wonderful session. And I wanted to raise a topic that, uh, that might be very tricky. The development of new technology as, and uh, robotics is uh, very important, especially for dependent people. But there is some criticism on the extent to which this development is counting on dependent people because it might not be helping just the dependent people, but helping the uh, caretakers. And if you only help the caretakers, those dependent people might end up being more dependent. So how could that new technology be tested with the with dependent people so it can meet the, their needs? In private companies, there is uh, uh, they're going to develop things that that are better for the future. 
but they do not always focus on the needs of the user, the end user. What we tend to do in research labs, end users have to be involved from the beginning. The first work package you submit has to have the tasks, the end client, among other features. And uh, the disabled person must be at the core of this study. If it helps the caretaker, then that, so that can also be good, and they should also participate in the study. We don't believe that you have to take out some of the parts that sh could be involved in the study. And any uses are included from the very beginning, so there are no, actually, I don't think there are risks of them being left out. And the solutions we put forward are always an add-on. The, the goal is not to remove the caretakers or the uh, therapists or whoever the person is who has the, in, the information and, and the, the ability to improve things. We are trying to relieve some burden from the caretakers and improve the quality of the persons if some things can be done by a robot. Some people are saying that robots might take over and do a, a relative's job and that's not that's not the goal at all. The idea is to keep the relatives or the caretakers fresh. Often, very often, the technology is uh, done with the idea not to replace anyone, but it is true that often uh, there is a possibility to remove the human part because of costs and people might be replaced by m machines as it happens and that's a very negative downside some researchers on w are working on how these technologies can be tested with uh, the actual patients. There's going to be a session at the UN on this matter, on cognitive robots for people with Alzheimer's or other neurodegenerative uh, diseases. So they will be looking into assistance uh, robots. Robots in education can be more efficient for students with different abilities in the same classroom. So there are many issues that we need to look into and verify before implementing certain technologies in the classroom. But it is not about looking the other way when it comes to technology. It's about collaborating. Let's see if we have time for one more question. Two more. But you need to be brief, all of you. Also, you with your answers. You need to be super fast. I'm Begoña González, and I have a question for Guillem. I work 
uh, in cooperation projects and are very interested in using robotics in uh, impoverished countries. So, yeah, well, I'll be very fast. Sorry. So how are you harnessing this uh, technology so it is not a vertical transfer and you can empower people in uh, developing countries and their governments? In AI for Good, we are promoting that uh, developing countries have... Actually, all we do is open source. So it's open for everyone. If you look at uh, innovation in robotics in Africa, it is very reduced. And if you want to find professors developing solutions in robotics in different parts of the world, you won't find many. So we need more people and we need more education at every level more coordination as well. And you can do this through AI for Good, Fiber Voluntarios, and other entities willing to give the means to those who wouldn't have them otherwise. Another question. So it could be used for many functionalities, such as knowing exactly when to soar. It's his turn. It's his turn. And he's got the right, just like you do. First of all, let me thank you for everything you're doing. And this is a question for all three of you. No, no, not all three. There's no time for that. It's for all three. Also for the journalist, she also has a right to respond. I don't know whether she knows about this, but uh, in communication and marketing, we have been hearing, especially in the last weeks, we've been hearing that AI is going to take the jobs of copywriters and uh, communication agencies and so on and so forth. I would like to know your point of view. What do you think about this? Well, I guess that basically what uh, all these people will need to do uh, is to use AI instead of uh, working on the site. And that's the truth. At work, we use AI every day. Chat TPT, AI, all that. We use it, but we do not, we're not replacing ourselves. We are using new skills and new capacities. Same thing for creative, for creativity. You can combine music with AI. And it will be difficult to prevent that, uh, because it's going to impact all of society, all of it. AI of AI for good. Sounds very good, but there are many topics, such as the job loss, that are important. There are studies saying that millions of jobs will disappear in the next years, but million other jobs, uh, millions of other jobs will appear as well. But you need to be uh, young people updated and using this both ways. I agree with you. We need to bring on those tools to our daily lives. We're not going to speak about copyrights because that's a very long story and we don't have time for that, but that would be an interesting discussion. Thanks to both of you. Thank you very much.